the struggle of discipling ourselves every day fades. That struggle fades when we realize the joy that we are being invited back into. It's as if every day we are invited to be saved anew. That's the invitation to us every single day. We wake up in the wrestling match of Romans 7, but we're invited to be reminded there's no condemnation for you today because Jesus won. You can walk in that. That's the, that's the offer for you. That new mercy awaits. As you're seated, go ahead and grab your Bible. Open it up to Romans chapter 7 this morning. Romans chapter 7. We'll be at both Romans chapter 7 and Romans chapter 8 this morning. We are working our way this year through this idea of what it means to be equipped. Uh, we first looked for six weeks or so at the idea of what it means to be equipped for the spread of the gospel. This week, we're gonna, this week and the next three weeks after this, we're going to think about what it means for us to be equipped to disciple. We see that command in Scripture that we are to make disciples. We see the word disciples all over the Scripture. But what does it mean for us to actually disciple someone or to disciple ourselves? How do we go about doing that? What does that look like? That's what we're going to deal with over the next six weeks or so, or four weeks or so. So let me just draw out some things before we get to Romans 7 and 8, just kind of to set up the whole series that I want you to kind of fix in your mind because many of you have walked into this room and I say the word disciple or I say the word discipleship and you have a very specific understanding of what that word means. Maybe you've been taught a certain way or a certain thing that that word applies to. And what I want to do before we get started in the scriptures and before we get started in the series is I want to undo some of those very specific applications of that word. And I think you'll see why as we work through this. But I want to make a few notes. I drew several of these out of an article or kind of adapted them out of an article I was reading the other day. Did you know that the word discipleship never occurs in the Scriptures? It doesn't show up. It's not there. In fact, the word disciple is never even used specifically as a verb. The closest we have to the word disciple being used as a verb is when it's attached to making, when Jesus tells to go and make disciples. That's the closest it comes to being a verb. In fact, in the New Testament, Christians and disciples are the same thing. Over and over and over again, if you go look up the word disciple in the New Testament, you'll find, one, it only occurs in the, New, in the Gospels and in Acts. Paul never uses the phrase. Peter never uses the phrase. None of the letters use the phrase. Hebrews never uses the phrase. Revelation never uses the phrase. It's only in the Gospels and in the letters. When we talk, and when we talk about disciples... And this is where I want to peel back some of what some of you may understand or may have adopted this mindset, perhaps. When we talk about disciples, we are not referring to this second stage of Christianity. There are many people that believe, and there are even ministries set up that believe that there are Christians and then there are disciples. And I want you to know that language and that idea is foreign to the New Testament. The New Testament has no concept of the idea that there is a disciple over here and then there's just your average run-of-the-mill Christian over here. In the New Testament, they are one and the same. In fact, in the book of Acts, it says in Antioch, for the first time, the disciples were called Christians. That's the understanding of a disciple. A disciple is a Christian. When we make it something different and we begin to tear our Christianity, we begin to draw separations that the Bible never draws. And we begin to put the idea, because most of the time what you'll see is you'll see, if you have, you have your regular Christians, and then you have your disciples, and then you have your really advanced ones, and we call them disciple makers. But the reality is, the New Testament says, 
that there are Christians who are both discipled and disciplers. They make disciples and they are discipled. That's the reality of the New Testament. In fact, the noun and the verb, they, it just does not appear, or the, the, it doesn't appear outside of the Gospels and the book of Acts. And so to think that there is some prescribed tier of Christianity across the New Testament, is just, it's just foreign. It's not there. So let's make clear, when we talk about discipleship, when we say the word, it's not wrong to use that word, but we need to understand we are describing something that is inherently biblical. But it is never defined in one explicit way. The idea of making a disciple is never defined in one explicit way in the Scriptures. I want you to let that sink into your heart and your mind today. Because you may have been convinced at one point that discipleship is one particular thing. Well, we do discipleship on Sunday nights. That's what Sunday nights are for. That's discipleship. We do discipleship in the context of small groups. Or we do discipleship in the context of Sunday school or Bible communities. Or we do discipleship in the context of an accountability group. And you may have bought into the idea that that is where discipleship occurs. But I want you to know if that is the only place you think discipleship occurs, you have a very unbiblical understanding of what it means to make a disciple. All of those work towards discipleship and all of those work towards making disciples, but none completely contain all that the Bible points to when it mentions and speaks of making disciples. We need to understand scripturally what making a disciple looks like. We need to always take what the scriptures say first. In Acts chapter 14, it says, When they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium. That was in the context of one of the missionary journeys. Okay? The context there says they preached the gospel and many disciples were made. So, is that discipleship? Well, it just said that they made disciples, didn't it? So that is discipleship. But what did they do there? It seems as though they preached the gospel and people responded. And then Paul and his compatriots left. There was no teaching them to obey everything. There was no long, small group accountability, discipleship process built into that. So at least in part, making disciples is simply the preaching of the gospel so that people can be converted. At least in part. But then you also have Matthew 28, 19, and 20 that you're all for, probably very familiar with. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So the concept of discipling is present there as well. But it's a much bigger process, isn't it? It's baptizing them, seeing them converted, but then walking alongside of them in a long journey of teaching them all that Jesus has commanded and how that applies and works out inside of our lives. And so that also is making disciples. So you see, making disciples is not just one thing. Discipleship is not, cannot be pegged down to just one way and one thing. Because there's discipleship of other people, there's discipleship of ourselves. You see, it's much bigger than you might think it is. And it's much, more, it's much less defined than you might think it is. Now next week and the weeks after, we're going to look at how and how we disciple other people. But I want you to just, that if I had to adopt a definition for what discipleship looks like and what it means, it sim it's simply, to boil it down, I think of it like this. It's helping people follow Jesus. That's the essence of it. Whether that person is yourself, whether that person is your child, your spouse, somebody else around, an unbeliever, you can, in effect, disciple an unbeliever in helping them move closer to Jesus. You can push them and encourage them and draw them towards Jesus. And in effect, that is what discipleship is, is helping someone, yourself or others, to follow Jesus. In, 
And if that's your definition of what discipleship is, you can see how broad it can be applied. You can see how broad it can be then in that you are doing the work of making disciples. So in the scriptures, the concept of discipleship is everywhere, but let's be careful in defining the term so narrowly that we draw up a system that we must walk through that ultimately can differentiate between followers of Christ as this Christian or disciple or disciple maker. Because what we do when we adopt that mindset is that just creates this cycle of guilt for those who are not engaged in the system. And it creates the temptation for pride or arrogance for those who are. Because if you're not in it, you're saying, man, I really need to get my act together. I really need to be involved in that. I really need to have, and it's just the cycle of guilt. Whereas if you are inside it, you're like, man, why can't that person get their act together? Why are they not doing this? Why are they not following Jesus like this? The last thing I want to do today is to throw another guilt trip upon tired and weary people who are truly trying to follow Jesus and simply just want to help other people follow Jesus as well. Now listen, I know I've done that in the past, and I am sorry for that. It's not a good preaching model to do that. No doubt there's a place for people to be challenged, and I pray I can walk that line today, inviting you to return to the grace of the gospel that saves us and also teaches us how to behave and to think and to live as a disciple of Jesus. Today, I want us to focus, though, on what it looks like to disciple ourselves. How do we disciple ourselves? So often when we think about discipling people, we forget that we have a responsibility to disciple ourselves. Yes, it is great if somebody has walked alongside you at some point in your life and helped you to follow Jesus more closely. I praise God that you had somebody in your life who would do that, whether it was a parent, whether it was a teacher, whether whoever it might have been, a friend, somebody hopefully has come alongside you at some point in your life and helped you to follow Jesus. But what were they doing, if you really boil it down and think about it? If they were doing it correctly, what they were doing was teaching you how you can follow Jesus. They can't, nobody can follow Jesus for you. We know nobody can get you saved. Nobody can be saved on your behalf. In the same way, nobody can do the steps to follow Jesus for you. I cannot Read the Bible for you and make, that rela- make you have a closer relationship with Jesus for you. Only you can do that. Now, I can show you how. I can walk with you. I can encourage you. I can point you to tools. I can do all of those kinds of things. But nobody ultimately can do that work for you. So we have a responsibility because the scriptures are clear in this that we are to follow Jesus, right? Everybody on board with that? You have a responsibility to follow Jesus. That responsibility is discipling yourself. Following Jesus yourself. But here's the bottom line. Whether you had somebody to teach you or whether you don't, when you become a Christian, the Bible tells us that you have everything you need to grow as a follower of Christ. Let me take you to a text. You don't turn there, I'll read it to you. You can make a note if you want to. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 Verses 16, 17, and 18. Let me read these to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But when one turns to the Lord, so when somebody is converted, when they turn to the Lord, he says the veil is removed. That means that we can now see clearly, okay? Listen to what he says. When the, the veil is removed, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, Every one of us who is a follower of Christ with an unveiled face, meaning we can now see clearly, with an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being, listen to this carefully, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That is the discipleship of yourself. God is at work in you as we with unveiled faces, with eyes that are clear, look at Jesus, the Spirit who lives and dwells in us, transforms us and changes us into the image of Christ. What more is discipleship if it's not that? 
becoming more like Jesus through the power of the Spirit. That is discipleship, being transformed into the image of Christ through the Spirit of God. That is discipling ourselves through the power of the living Spirit of God. So listen, what does he say? Gazing at the glory of the Lord transforms us into the image of Jesus. We become more like Jesus by looking at Jesus. And that's what I want to invite you into today, to remind us that you are equipped to disciple yourself simply by constantly returning and gazing upon Jesus. Look with me at Romans chapter 7 this morning. You may remember these chapters from our journey through Romans a year or so ago. Romans 8 is probably my favorite chapter in all of Scripture. Today, we're not going to look at all of both of the chapters, but what I want you to grasp today is the nature of discipling ourselves and the battle that that is within us. Because it's not easy. If it was easy, we wouldn't have any struggles with it, right? We wouldn't have to preach this series if we were all walking with Jesus and following closely with Jesus. We wouldn't need this kind of instruction. But let's start in Romans 7 because we know it's not easy and I want you to know that the scriptures know it's not easy and they speak to why it's not easy to follow Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 7 starting in verse 18. Paul says this. He says, I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now listen, I don't really ask for a lot of amens. I'm not one of those kind, I just, it's just, it's weird to me. I don't ask for that, but does anybody besides me feel those two verses in their bones? I mean, does that not just touch down and deeply resonate in your soul? I, what I want to do, I know what is right, and I want to do what is right, but every day I wake up and I do the other. I just, one writer says, this is, the, the, the heading over this text says something like, um, how's, it, how's it phrased? The law and sin. And One writer said, this is, really this text is why we can't get our act together. Because this is the truth, is it not? Every day we wake up right here. Now listen, if that's not you, if this is not your struggle, you don't have this problem, then you can probably just sit back. But Paul had this struggle, obviously. I have this struggle. So if it's not you, then, then kick back and you can take the rest of this time off. But I would guess that most of you who are a follower of Jesus and who are actively trying to follow Jesus each and every day, this struggle is very, very real to your heart and to your soul. I guess most of you are right here with me because this is the struggle of the Christian life, isn't it? This is also the problem that we face with discipling ourselves. It's this Romans 7 problem of the evil I don't want to do is always right there tempting me and drawing me, and so often I go that direction in so many ways. But but at the same time, in so many ways, this verse is also encouraging to me in a weird, strange sort of way. For one, it tells me I'm not crazy, and I'm not alone. The struggle is real. Maturity and Christ-likeness are not immediate. I don't default into this. I don't, this is not the natural inclination of our hearts. But maybe the biggest reason of all is it tells me that I'm not a failure. At least an eternal one. I may have failed in the moment. Paul is very real about the fact I do what is evil. It's not what I want. And he's showing us the wrestling between those stages is because of the indwelling nature of sinfulness that still resides in us because we're still on this earth. We haven't escaped that sinfulness yet. When I read Romans 7, I read my everyday life, the struggle that I awake to every single day. 
So when we say, why do we struggle to grow in Christ? We read Romans 7 and we drop down to verse 21 and we read, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. Like I I know what is right. I, I have a new heart. The Spirit has changed me. But in verse 23, but I see in my members, in my body, in my flesh, another law waging war against the law of my mind, what I know is right, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. What he's saying there, he's saying, listen, I have this wrestling match, this eternal struggle in my heart that we will continue to experience until the day we meet Jesus and become completely like him. That there is the evil that lies in my flesh by nature of my sinfulness. But at the same time, I have this new heart where God has wrote the law upon my heart, as he says in the Old Testament. He's written it, he's etched it upon our souls when we come to him. So I have this wrestling match inside of me, this this eternal tug of war between my old flesh and my my new heart. The old flesh says, don't you remember how good this is? But then my new heart says, but you found something better. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. And depending on external factors and all the things that I face in my life, whether I got to sleep, what, what my kids may have done, what my wife may have done, what my friends may have done, whether I want to go to work or whether what work is, all of these things compile to tilt the scales in our lives each and every day. Some days, man, it is, it's easy to live in the new life. For instance, you go on a mission trip, you go to camp, man, it is easier, much easier in those moments to live in the new life because that's all you're thinking about. That's what you're surrounded by. But man, you go to work and that person shows up in your office or at your desk or at your cash register or that kid walks into your classroom again, And man, it gets a little bit harder. It's this wrestling match, this struggle. And here's the thing, until the return of Jesus, this is our reality. The constant pull of the old man versus the new man. It may even build up in you to the point that it did in Paul. Romans chapter 7, verse 24. Wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Remember, he's got this split thing going on, this body that is afflicted by sin, this body of death, he calls it. You notice, he does, he, you notice what he does not say. He does not say what or how or anything like that. He says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Listen, that is a cry for help a cry of desperation, a cry searching for deliverance. But when you keep reading, you find that it was also a cry that he knew the answer to already. He knew who was. It wasn't a cry into the abyss, into the unknown. For as a Christian, we have a deliverer. We have someone who has conquered this body of death. And though this body of sin, this old self, will try to to take me back to the grave every single day because it's so full of the old self and corrupted through the work of sin in me, Romans 7, 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then drop down to Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Listen, this exchange from Romans 7 to Romans 8 is the very essence of what it looks like to disciple ourselves. Waking up in Romans 7, but gazing upon and living in Romans 8. 
I love how one writer describes this. He says, how do we get out of this mess? We can't. But God does what we cannot do. So while the storm of Romans 7 rages inside of us, the truth of Romans 8 has us safe and sound. You introduce the truth of Romans 8 to every corner of the room, every dark place in your heart, as often as you can, as much as you can, as fiercely as you can. Do you see these words in Romans 8? They remind us of the incredible power of the grace and the mercy of God in our life. He said, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we become a believer in Jesus, though that eternal, remember, he is wrestling. Paul is, he says, I am actively wrestling with this law of sin in me and this law of the grace of God in me. But he says, listen, the victory is eternal and it is already won because there is no condemnation. Though the wrestling exists, Though sometimes I don't get to eight and I stay in seven, there is no condemnation. Why? Why? Look at verse two. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. In Romans 7, he says there's this law, these two laws that work within me. They're wrestling within me. But listen, one of them is better than the other one, and one of them wins every time. And that's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. For God has done with the physical law, the law of the flesh could, this verse 3, could not do. And it gets even better by sending his own son. Watch this. Remember the, remember the wrestling match. Law of the flesh, law of the spirit. Watch what God does. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus came bearing the same flesh that we bear, right? Now here's why that's important. Because in coming in the flesh... He condemned sin in the flesh. In essence, what, God, what he is saying there is, listen, the wrestling match that goes on inside of you didn't happen in Jesus. Because Jesus won the match. It's over in Jesus. Jesus. That's why there is no condemnation. Not because we win the match, but because Jesus did. And he applies that victory to us. Listen, when you coach little kids in soccer, I mean like the little ones, all right, if you've got one really good player, you dominate. Like that's all you gotta have is one. If he's really good, you win almost every game. You just give him the ball, he dribbles around everybody, and he goes and scores. Okay, everybody else chases him, his team, the other team, everybody else chases him, and he goes and scores. Okay, listen, that's you. You're the chaser. Like, you wander around. You just look, you're just, I mean, or you're like the kid who's just running away from the pack, you know, and running the opposite direction. That's us. That's you and me. But Jesus wins. Every time, for, and guess what? Everybody on his team wins with him. Because Jesus has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. He condemned sin in the flesh, verse 4, in order that, watch this, that the righteous requirement, the law had a requirement that you must be perfect, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Listen, the struggle of discipling ourselves every day fades, that struggle fades when we realize the joy that we are being invited back into. It's as if every day we are invited to be saved anew. That's the invitation to us every single day. We wake up in the wrestling match of Romans 7, but we're invited to be reminded, hey, listen up. There's no condemnation for you today because Jesus won. You can walk in that. 
you can stay right there. That's the, that's the offer for you. That new mercy awaits. Listen, do you remember when you received mercy for the first time from Jesus? Do you remember your salvation? Do you remember being saved, the release, the freedom, the joy, the hope? Maybe would you like to have that for the first time or for the hundred millionth time? The offer still stands. For the saved and for the lost, the offer stands. Jesus has done what you couldn't do. So grab hold of it. Lay hold of it. Receive the gift. The scriptures tell us that because of Jesus and because of his work, the law has been fulfilled and the righteousness of Jesus now belongs to me each and every day. New mercies every day. There's an incredible, an amazing passage in the book of Lamentations of all places that speaks of this exact truth. Listen to these words. Lamentations verse th- chapter 3, verse 21 through 26. Listen carefully. But this I call to mind. I remind myself of this, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that we should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I mean, that, that, that's Lamentations, and it's amazing. It's this miracle that somehow it goes perfectly with Romans 8. How does that happen? Maybe it's because God knows what he's doing, and he's known what he's doing forever. That the offer to you is new. We are, listen, you are equipped to disciple yourself, to help yourself follow Jesus each and every day because Jesus is ready to renew us in his image each and every day. You might be thinking, Pastor, it cannot be that simple. But I would ask you simply this, what if it is? What if it actually is that easy? What if the discipling of our hearts and souls is just returning to the awe and majesty of our salvation every day and then applying that awe and that mercy to every encounter of our life? Do you remember the words of Jesus? Do you remember how Jesus described those who follow him? Do you remember? Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we return to the gospel every day, we live out the reality of that text. Because we are returning to the one who has redeemed us and shapes us and makes us so we can disciple ourselves and move ourselves towards holiness, towards Jesus, because of what Jesus has done. By just reminding ourselves. When we return to the gospel day by day, we live out what Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 4 when he says, I say this and I testify in the Lord. Don't walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. That's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. To put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Or what he speaks to the Colossian church when he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are close to Jesus, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with God in Christ. With Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will also appear with him on glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of those things, the wrath of God is coming. And you once walked in them when you were living them, but now you must put them all away. 
anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Now, why do I read that to you? Because you hear those verses. You hear that put off. You hear that flee these things and get away from that. And some of you immediately think, I need to do better. No, you need to look at Jesus. Because here is the essence. Here's the essence. We grow into the image of Christ and we kill sin, not by rigid accountability, not by any worldly strategy. We put away sin because we found something better. If you want to walk away from the sin in your life, then realize that Jesus is better. That's the answer. That's how you follow Christ. That's how you disciple yourself. By waking up every day and saying, this world offers me this, but I found something that's better. And then you live that out. You don't have to prepare for every situation. You don't have to get ready for every circumstance. You simply walk into every day saying, I know what the world has to offer. I've tasted it. I've run down those roads, but Jesus is better. That's the essence of discipling ourselves, and that's the invitation of today. Realize that Romans 7 is painting the picture of what sin is trying to do in your life. Sin is trying to tell you that it can satisfy. It is trying to tell you it can take the place of the nearness to Jesus that you have been offered, but Romans 8 is standing there saying, reminding to us and inviting us to return to the one who loves our soul and has set us free. Today, there is no guilt trip to get your act together but simply an invitation to recognize the reality of Romans 7 in your heart, but gaze into and believe and live in and receive the truth of Romans 8, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because Jesus has set you free. Would you pray with me this morning? Listen, you may be here this morning in one of probably two places. Either you're a follower of Christ who struggles to follow Jesus every day. And if that's you, it is my prayer that you would just simply take up the truth of Romans 7 and Romans 8. Let Romans 7 be real. Don't act like it doesn't exist. Don't act like there isn't this wrestling match, like you've got it all figured out. It's real. And it's okay that it's real. It's not okay that you stay there. Because he says, listen, there's no condemnation because you've been set free. So would you today, would you just return to the one who loves your soul? The one who set you free initially, the one who saved you. Not to be saved again eternally, but just to be reminded of the grace and the mercy that Christ has shown for your life. And listen, I guarantee you, if you live every single day gazing at Romans chapter 8, your struggle with sin will fade. It won't be immediate. It might be. It might not be. It might be a daily wrestling, a daily reminding yourself of Romans 8 that it is true, that Jesus is better, and that's how we eternally fight sin, and that's how God sets us free from sin by helping us to see that Jesus is better. Or you may be in a second place here this morning and you may have never experienced the grace of Jesus in your life. You may say, Pastor, I live in Romans 7 all the time. I've never been set free by the grace of Romans 8. I walk in sin and darkness every single day. Listen, the only reason you know that is because God is showing it to you. Otherwise, you wouldn't care. So if you're here today and you struggle with your sin in your life and you've never received the forgiveness of Jesus, today I want to offer that to you. So I just simply ask you, would you receive that gift? That Jesus did what you could not do. By dying on the cross, he fulfilled the law. 
By coming back to life, he canceled out and crushed sin and set us free. Would by faith you seize hold of that gift, lay hold of it by faith and receive salvation in Christ today? If that's you today, man, I would love to talk with you today or some perhaps this week. If you'd like to follow through in that decision of turning to Jesus and being set free from your sin, I'd love to speak with you. I'll be down here when we sing here in a moment, or you can find me after the service, or you can use one of those yellow cards and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk to you more about what that means, what that looks like. But as we stand and sing here in a moment, if you're a believer, would you sing with earnestness about the grace that we have received? about the power that Christ gives to us and offers to us. Jesus, come and have your way among us. We want to be your people. So in the name of your Son, we pray. Amen.